I'm going to continue on in the sermon series that I started last week uh, by discussing uh, spiritual warfare in the Bible again. So please stand, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 78. I'll read verse 49. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath and indignation, and trouble by sending evil angels among them. As I discussed last week, uh, we've got a spiritual battle going on in this world, and God in Psalm 78 is telling people that he's going to send evil angels among them. So he's testifying that uh, against the people in Psalm 78, not only those that broke the covenant, but also against the Babylonian heathens and idolaters of the earth. And the reality is, we are living in a world inhabited by fallen angels who are evil spirits. This is something that, again, I don't feel is discussed or preached about as often as it should. If you're covered by the blood of the Lamb, you've been given power over all power of the enemy. But part of our job as a Christian, the main part is being in the mission field, in the world of lost people, and being good witnesses to testify of the truth, what God has done for us, so that others can come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's an important part of our walk as Christians. So uh, I'm going to get into some topics that are very personal to me today. There are people that are possessed by evil spirits. If you've read God's word, there's many, many accounts of that. Uh, they can receive powers of shape-shifting, see Daniel chapter 4, financial gain, see Acts chapter 16 for one part of scripture that describes that. Uh, there's a former real vampire and Catholic priest named Bill Sneblin, who is now a Christian, that sucked blood from people as his fangs grew to puncture skin. He was a real shape-shifting vampire. When he wanted to feed, his fangs would grow. Now this may sound strange to some people because we're conditioned by our media, especially all the popular movies that we see on television, that vampirism and shape-shifting is just a fantasy and we can kind of detach from reality and watch as, uh, as our favorite actors portray vampires. Uh, when you become a Christian, you realize that the world lies in deception. Everyone's under the power of Satan. And even if you're a Christian, you don't want to have a spirit of slumber attached to you like all of them had in Matthew chapter 25. So back to Bill Sneblin, uh, a long story very short, he is very happy now to be delivered from the bondage of Satan uh, thanks to the prayers of a saved Christian. And this has been something that has been probably over 35 years ago that this happened to Bill. But uh, why Bill Sneblin? I'm going to talk about him. Bill is quoted as saying, Perhaps some have heard of my account. I was around 10 years of age and out trick-or-treating with my friend. It was a clear October night and I chanced to look up at the stars. When I did, the stars were not there, but were replaced with a sky full of dark, leathery, bat-like creatures. I stood there transfixed. These beings, whatever they were, opened their eyes. Dark ruby red slits of light burned into my soul, and I felt an unholy thrill. I believed that at that moment I was defiled by occult power. It began a long, slow slide into evil, that would end with me becoming a witch and a Satanist. Now, Bill, like me, was raised Catholic, uh, and I believe many of us have been titillated by the occult. Uh, whether you watch your favorite horror movies on TV, or you have an experience similar to the one that Bill testifies about, uh, we are conditioned to accept the occult and not think about it as reality. And it's something that's widespread in our culture. And it's great being a saved Christian, but we have to realize the mission field is under the power of Satan. And none of this is pretend. It's all very real. And I've had many experiences. 
Bill is often mocked because of his testimony. A lot of people think he is uh, a liar and making stuff up and giving false accounts. Uh, but my experience is that Bill is telling the absolute truth. I've had a lot of similar experiences in my life, and I trust that Bill is giving honest testimonies. And many of the things that he, he has experienced, I've experienced very similar types of things. I'm going to get into that in this sermon. with Brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be. And yes, I say this as a former vampire, <laughs> you know, but, you know, it's like they say, never, never ask an, a recovering alcoholic about what he thinks about booze either, you know, I mean, you'll get a 10-minute tirade. So I wanted to show a clip of Bill Sneblin, uh, and he was in a good mood laughing. I didn't want to show him uh, in any other light because he is a joyful person now, but what he just said was extremely important and extremely serious. He was a vampire, a real vampire. I was raised Catholic. I lived in a home during the 1980s that had evil spirits in it. Our family experienced spiritual attacks and torments, which caused great fear at times. Here's just a few of the experiences we encountered. I'm going to share this just to make people aware, as many of us are, of how real ultimately the Word of God is. And God's never going to prove himself other than the testimony of Jesus Christ. You either believe the Word of God or you don't. But since I believe the Word of God and have been saved, I'm going to give some testimony. So in the mid-1980s, I laid in bed around midnight. I felt an intense fear and the air seemed thick as pure evil appeared at the foot of my bed. My bedroom was dark, but I could see, feel an evil presence. I felt a devil trying to create panic, fear, and even try to possess me. My first thought was to get up from my bed and rebuke the Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. I thought about it, but I didn't execute it. Then I got very angry. I, I had a choice. I could either cower in fear and pull the covers over my head, or I could get up and rebuke it in the name of Jesus. So I sensed that it was leaving my room, and maybe it was fleeing because of the faith that I had, even though I was a lost person, I don't know. The Lord knows. But I sensed it leaving my room, and I followed it to the hallway. I told it to leave my family alone as I verbally rebuked it in the name of Jesus Christ. As soon as I said that, I could tell it fled because of the name of the Lord. Nothing that I did, but because of Jesus Christ, it fled. Although I was not saved, there is power in the name of God, and I gave a couple of uh, verses there for people to look up. But even uh, if you're not saved, God protects people from Satan and the dark realm that surrounds us. Because if he didn't, we'd all be driven crazy, insane, and commit suicide. That's how much power the devil has been given. We have no power over him except the protection that God puts on everyone. And then when you become a Christian, you're covered by the blood of the Lamb, and Satan doesn't have access to you except for purposes of correction. So that's my own personal testimony. But I'm going to share some testimonies that have been given to me by my immediate family. So my brother, my younger brother, was addicted to hard drugs and saw an evil face appear in his bedroom that was tormenting him. Uh, it mocked him, tormented him, uh, and I, you know, in doing my best to represent what he described to me. But he was a lost person, as was I, and uh, it could have been a different evil spirit in the house that we lived in, or it could have been the same one that was tormenting me that manifested itself in a slightly different way to my brother. But what matters is we were not completely saved Christians. We weren't saved, but God in his great mercy had a layer of protection so that we wouldn't be driven completely out of our minds. And so that was his testimony. I think the hard drug use opened him up to attacks that I may not have experienced. My dad, uh, who when we first moved into this house, slept in the room that I took as my bedroom for a couple nights, and uh, felt an extreme evil presence, but he never told me. So he switched uh, 
to sleeping in the master bedroom of, the, of this house, and all the bedrooms were in the upstairs area. And one of the first nights that he spent in the bedroom before the rest of our family moved in, because my dad and I prepared this house, it was like the Munster's house. It was full of cobwebs, it was dark, it had been abandoned for about a year. We got it for a great price, kind of like our own little Amityville horror uh, in Wheaton, Illinois. Uh, but he testified later, many years later, that he saw a tall ghost in the doorway of his bedroom one of those first nights that just he and I were in the house, uh, having stayed late to clean it up and uh, prepare it for the rest of our family to move in. And it caused him great fear. And unfortunately, his reaction when he saw this apparition was to pull the covers over his head. Uh, I didn't react the same way years later that he did, but I uh, just want to let people know that, you know, different people react to different ways to these types of things, and you want to have the bold confidence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even if you're not saved, there is power in his name. See Matthew chapter 7 on that. My mother saw an animal spirit, and she was in the bedroom after we moved in some years later. Uh, she and my father were sleeping. It was maybe around 3 in the morning, the wee hours of the morning. And the room became very cold, uh, unusually cold, and she had a rosary. She would always say her rosary and leave it on her nightstand, and that rosary uh, flew from the nightstand to the floor and an animal spirit appeared in the room and she described its tail as like a long type of rodent tail but it was yet a devil so you know the the devil tails that you see in illustrations there's a lot of reality to them but it was very long and thin and she remembered it distinctly and this animal was circling around her bed the room was dark, the room was cold, and by the grace of God, uh, the spirit eventually went away, but there was no reproving or rebuking done on their part. Uh, God, just in his great mercy, took that spirit away and it stopped tormenting them after a short time. But my father could also feel the evil, according to my mother's testimony, and uh, it just is another example of what was going on in this house that we lived in. Now, we were Catholic, and my parents were very faithful in terms of the Catholic faith. And we as children, you know, overall were obedient to our parents. We weren't perfect by any means, but uh, we were not covered by the blood of the Lamb. We were not saved. And as a result, we were opened up to spiritual attacks and... Uh, it's just yet another account of the realities of what's going on here in this world. So as an unsaved person exposed to certain types of evil, I had sharp pains that would periodically occur in my head, which caused me to close my eyes, shake my head, and strike my skull for relief. They would happen, I'm trying to guess, maybe once every couple of months. And I never understood. I thought, am I having a stroke? What's going on? And then I had an experience years later where I felt my left arm twitch violently. Really unusual experience. And then a sensation followed of something crawling inside my arm. At that time, I was not sure what to make of it. I thought I was having a stroke again, although I was in really good health. Uh, once I got saved, none of this ever happened again. And I've been saved for uh, going on, well, it's been at least 14 years now. So uh, I just wanted to give a testimony of my own personal experiences. And uh, Bill Sneblin gave a testimony of how evil spirits can put sharp pains in your mind if they have a purpose of doing so. I can't say 100% that that was what was going on with me, but I can say I have not experienced these pains anymore since I've been a saved Christian, and my physical health is not as good as it was back then. So I believe by the power of God, any spiritual attacks were permanently sent away. God's word is true. 
However, all these experiences, nothing, nothing can even remotely compare to the fear that I felt when I believed on the testimony of Jesus Christ. Bill Sneblin, as a saved Christian man, gave a lecture. He told me to get an AV 1611 Bible, and I heard out of his mouth a distinction between the normal KJV and the true AV 1611. And I went out and ordered a 1611 Bible and got it and started reading it and held it up above my head and told Lord, the Lord, this is your word. Thy word is true. And I believed it with all my heart. And I started reading uh, God's word on business trips. And then I fell into a horrific chastening. And I didn't know that this was part of becoming a Christian. I felt like the worst person ever. And I felt like, you know, it would have been a relief to have boiling oil poured all over my body. That's how uh, mentally horrifying the chastening was. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Ran through my head over and over and over. I had to quit my job. I had a great job. I couldn't work anymore. And uh, my wife saw that I was not able to eat food. I was starting to lose weight at an unhealthy weight uh, rate of weight loss. And uh, I was just uh, completely broken down as an individual. I had no idea that's what happened to save people, uh, the chastening that I was getting. Uh, so the good news is that somebody out there did a great job witnessing because they were a saved Christian. And that made a huge difference in my life. So I want to encourage everyone Share your testimonies with others because you never know just by one of your testimonies what type of ultimate effect it will have, Lord willing, on other people. So it's a great thing. So I'm going to uh, show another brief clip of Bill Sneblin giving a testimony about God's word. For, you, for your soul and your spirit and your body. But I would tell you, I mean, you know, there without getting into other languages. I mean, for an English-speaking person, you've got to stick to the King James Bible for doctrinal truth because all the other Bibles have been fooled with. He has a great conviction for the Word of God, as I do. And although I don't necessarily agree with all of his individual doctrines, he is a man that's been used by God to a great extent to witness to the lost of this world and to help certain types of people with spiritual torments. And I thank the Lord for putting Bill in my life. I've spoken with Bill on a number of occasions, and he and I have a bond in terms of our Catholic upbringing and some of the spiritual uh, torments and crazy things that have happened in our lives. I've learned from him uh, tremendously. He's helped me, and he is the one person that inspired me the most to produce a number of films, A Lamp in the Dark, Tears Among the Wheat, and A Bridge to Babylon. And uh, that's my way of reaching out to people and showing just what the history of God's Word is and introduce them to the attacks and persecutions that are on the Word of God as I was taught as a young Catholic. As a young Catholic, I was taught that the authorized version, the King James Bible, whatever you call it, but the true AV 1611 is a corrupt testimony in that Martin Luther and King James were two names that stuck out in my head as heretics that broke up the Catholic Church, and you can only be saved by being Catholic. If you're not Catholic, you're going to hell. So that really made a big impression in my life, and uh, when I became saved, I wanted to reach out to people and let them know that there is a truth in this world that you can put your trust in, and that is Jesus Christ. And his word is true, and in the English language, it's the authorized version of 1611, where there is a word of a king, there is power. And uh, hell is no joke. It's going to be filled with devils and people. The lost need to be witnessed to now. And people are going there by default. Everyone's been condemned already. And then you've got 
a minority that identify as Christians. And in that group that is a minority, out of the Christian group, many will still be cast into the lake of fire, and only few out of that group that identifies as Christians are going to be saved. And this is explained in Job chapter 24, but you're going to need the true AV 1611 to understand it. And it's because of the tampering of the Word of God. You know, the Scripture cannot be broken. You cannot add to nor you can diminish from any single word without penalty. And even the saved Christians in Matthew chapter 25 are in a spirit of slumber. They don't understand what God is saying spiritually because there has been a problem with the way that they believe on the testimony that has oil in it. They've been beguiled by the sorceries of the Babylonian church. So trust in the Lord. Don't put confidence in men. The Holy Spirit will lead you to all truth and fellowship with other born-again believers so that you can edify one another and believe on every word of God. I'm going to continue this sermon series for at least a couple more weeks. I'm going to go into some different types of accounts next week uh, to get people thinking more about the realities of this world. And most importantly, what are the solutions? What can we do as Christians to reach out to the lost? Until I speak with you again, God bless everyone, and I'll look forward to talking again soon.